So, you want to save the world with clean energy? Make money doing it? Confused about the economic and technical realities of residential and commercial solar, batteries, heat pumps, EVs? Want the real world scoop on new energy technologies, not manufacture hype? Then tune in to the Weekly Energy Show, hosted by Barry Cinnamon. Insights from Barry's 40 plus years in the solar and energy industry will help you understand the future ways we'll generate and consume energy. And now, here's Barry. Welcome to this week's show. Now, this week's show is for solar customers and solar contractors who strive to install reliable solar systems and inverter manufacturers. So you're going to listen up to this show with some horror stories about solar power monitoring. Now, rooftop solar is super reliable. Customers know this. Contractors know this. Panel manufacturers know this. They guarantee their panels for 25 years. Inverter manufacturers know this. They guarantee their inverters for 10 to 25 years. Basically, the whole system is trouble free, except my my biggest headache and the headache of most installers, the most common rooftop solar problem is monitoring. Now, the good news is that the monitoring problems almost never, ever affect the system performance. They just affect the performance of the monitoring, so you think your system's not working. The inverters and the panels are always, almost always still working. Then the bad news is that both customers, because they're getting annoyed, they can't see what the performance is that day, and contractors have to spend time to get monitoring to work again. It's expensive and it's time consuming. It's the biggest hassle for solar contractors to maintain good customer relations and to keep their systems in the field running. Now, over the years, since 2001, I've installed and tested systems from a dozen companies. Many of them are still running, including Trace, SMA, Fat Spaniel, Xantrex, BP Solar, Solar, Sharp, Fronia, Sunrun, Enphase, SolarBridge, Power One, SolarEdge, JLM, Tygo, often multiple systems from these same companies. Now, inverter companies almost always make really great inverters. They're good at the electrical design, but they're not always great at software. In fact, some of them are pretty terrible at the software, especially when the software is not designed in the U.S. where the software's got to operate. The end result is terrible monitoring reliability, even when the inverters keep working. Now, my experiences with solar monitoring go back to 2001. I'm a Silicon Valley guy. I've been in solar a long time, but I spent some time in the software industry. I like new technology. And back in 2000, 2001, I was looking at taking some of this new internet technology to manage rooftop solar. That was the first business idea I had before I got back into doing installations. Now, the inverters out there use a variety of different monitoring systems. They're proprietary, they're clunky, but every inverter had an RS-485 serial port. You remember serial ports? Eh, it's like a USB, but it's just a, an early version. So this port would be hardwired with a three-wire cable or a four-wire cable between the inverter and the computer. And usually there was a special little RS-485 serial board you had to plug into some pins inside the inverter. And then there was a really nice DOS interface sometimes that can see the system performance. And the idea was to, that we had was to create a serial to Ethernet interface and then the Ethernet data would be sent up to a server and then any anywhere from a web browser you can view your data. And that was the idea I had. I developed it with some people from HP. Then my solar business took off and I said, up, hey, you know, I'm happily installing solar panels and I'm not in the software business as much anymore. I partnered with a friend who started up a company called Fat Spaniel to take over the product. So Fat Spaniel had the first general purpose internet monitoring system. It was a proprietary box with the Ethernet, software, and a serial interface. Had to make a custom interface for every inverter manufacturer and write custom software to read what data was coming out of the inverter. But the end result was it was reliable and it worked. Ironically, the biggest problem then, which is still one of the biggest problems now, is he had to have an enclosure and a power supply because this device often had to go outside. So they also had to get cooperation from a variety of internet companies, which wasn't always easy. They wanted to do monitoring their own way. And you also always depended on the home internet connection. Some more anecdotes from my solar monitoring history going back to 2002. Friend and customer Tom Beach, he was on our show a month ago or so, he has one of the original SMA inverters and the original Kia Solar 120 watt solar panel the original SMA monitoring system with RS-45. Everything still works. Over 15 years, his degradation was less than 0.4%. But his old computer no longer works. He can't find another computer that supports the old SMA monitoring protocols. You know, go find a 
DOSBot, it's still going to work. So the software and the computer hardware kind of moves on, but the internet is advancing, but the solar is still working. These old inverters are still inverting. So you got to watch out how these technologies change. You end up with a lot of orphan stuff. By the way, I have several boxes of five and a quarter inch floppy diskettes in my basement if anybody needs them. All right. So back at that time, SMA also had power line carrier monitoring. It was kind of slick. You could just kind of plug a box into any wall outlet and it would be able to talk to the inverter and it would communicate over the houses to a 120 volt electrical lines. It would kind of listen to it. Power line carrier, you've got a 60 cycle AC power line and you would send high frequency data over that. It was a really good idea. It's kind of like the way radio works. It worked great in Germany, but doesn't work so well here because there's too much noise on our electrical lines here. Our appliances make noise. The fluorescent lights made noise. The electric toothbrushes, battery chargers, power strips. So what ended up happening is we put in these power line carrier monitoring systems and, and they would almost never work continuously. Customers would get mad, sold us a bad inverter, and you know we would kind of look bad and, and basically we stopped doing it. You know, looking back again, in 2003, we installed the first BP Solar Home Monitoring System, which was very slick. Companies are doing this now, CTs with a wall-mounted display, customized software. Actually, my first experience with CTs around the Line 1 and Line 2 power lines going to a house, kind of still tricky to install now. Definitely not a DIY thing. But this monitoring system, whole house, was kind of expensive. You know, a contractor really should do it and has to do it. So it didn't really take off. And, you know, at the time, people really didn't care that much to see their home power consumption. It was a little bit clunky. Now, Sharp Sun Vista inverters took a different approach. These were great inverters circa 2002, 2003. There's kind of like a microwave oven design, but boy, they just kept working. Low efficiency, I think it was 93%, but they had three PowerPoint tracking inputs so they could really work with arrays all over the roof. And it had a little hardwired display, this little LCD display. I think it was two or three wires. You just wired the thing up, you drilled a hole through the wall, and, and it just worked. It was easy to wire up. And the inverters, these were little like flimsy inverters, like a sharp microwave oven. I think it's kind of the same thing on the inside. But they would work for 10 years. Unfortunately, you know, 15, 20 years later, they're almost all dead now. And they're hard to fix. So over the years, we installed a lot of Sunny Boy inverters. And so we um, started installing a lot of Sunny Boy web box devices because we just couldn't deal with the power line carrier. And um, this basically was a little box. It was a web server. And the box connected between RS-45 cable in the inverter. You had to put an RS-45 card in the inverter, run a cable out, would plug into the Sunny web server, and that Sunny web server would then plug into your home's internet connection. So it was good because it was kind of hardwired. We avoided the power line carrier noise problems, and I have one in my house. It hasn't worked since like 2010 because it's just the software was too complicated. I would change my internet setups in the house and just couldn't keep getting the, the monitoring to work again every time, every year or two that my router died or we changed internet programs. Providers. Not to mention the fact that the little wire that goes to the inverter was subject to damage. That's kind of my problem. But the software and the upgrades were really the issue. So it's still difficult to resolve customer issues. They have these old web boxes. They're, they're still good. The boxes are solid. The inverters may work, but their internet doesn't work like my friend Tom. All right. I also remember back in about 2007, a little company called Sunrun came to us, and they had a solar lease. Actually, it was a PPA that we really liked. It was a good way to kind of still sell solar to people when housing crash happened in 2007, 2008, they monitored their system with a completely separate revenue grade meter. So you had like a regular meter on the house that, that your utility dealt with, and then you put another meter base in that was only connected to the solar with their own meter, and this meter had a cellular connection in it. I thought it was kind of crazy and, you know, redundant, but you know what? The thing really worked. It was a little more expensive to install. That's a typical example where you spend more money up front and you get something that's just going to be more reliable. And you had to also, which is something that Sunrun covered, you had to pay for the data plan. That was built into their service. It worked out very reliable. There was no panel level monitoring, but they could tell what the performance of the system was. You know, they expected that you were going to get 10 kilowatt hours a day. And if you got one or none, an, an alert came out and somebody was able to take a look at it. And you know what? Those things are still reliable. A good approach. Another cool product that came along was Enphase. This was back in 2008, 2009. And their microinverters came with monitoring. So you had one indoor gateway. And we call a gateway is a little box. And it's got power provided to it. One end connects to your internet connection, the other end connects to whatever you're monitoring. And that worked pretty well. It was a good idea. So you could monitor every inverter that was on the roof underneath each panel. Therefore, you could monitor every panel. It sees voltage, temperature, power output, cycling, things like that. And this gateway would then have a standard ethernet cable to your router. And you have no wires to the microinverters because the last thing you want to do is worry about running wires up to the roof. And there was also, it was kind of nice, no 
outdoor extra installation. Nice, nice advantage of Enphase. Put the microinverters on the roof, plug it into a circuit breaker, wire it into a circuit breaker. You don't have to worry about mounting anything outside. And you just take this little box that was, you know, half the size of a shoe box, tiny little shoes, and plug it in. And then it would just go find the microinverters on the roof and then start communicating. Yeah, a little bit tricky to configure. A big problem was the power line carrier communications between the gateway and the rooftop inverters because you were depending on the wires that were going from the roof into the service panel. And then the service panel would have wires that are going to actually the outlet that you plug this gateway into. The communication wasn't always that good. There was noise on the line, just like the problem we had with SMA in 2001. And also, the customers would move the gateway around to a different outlet in the house, and maybe that outlet didn't have a good signal, or they plugged it into a power strip, or they did something else, and the thing would fail. A real pain in the neck. And there's a better solution. Okay, now we're talking about like why, why things work and why things don't. So here's one of the issues with power line carrier. It just doesn't work reliably over AC power lines. Lots of chips have been developed, lots of new ideas, and they're, get, they're getting better and better and better. But heck, from a solar installer standpoint, if I even have two out of 100 customers that have a problem, that's too, too many. But power line carrier does work over DC lines because there's no, should be no other noise on that lines. So companies that have optimizers on the roof that have DC power, DC lines going from the solar panel to the optimizer, the optimizer to the inverter, those lines aren't as noisy. So you can use power line carrier communication. Solar Edge takes this approach. Tygo takes this approach. A few others. Now, microinverters on the roof, they're, they're sending AC down, and you got noisier lines. So getting power line carrier to work properly there is a lot tougher. The microinverters sometimes drop out, or the whole communication drops out. Now, there's also problems with the indoor gateways and power line carrier. So you're trying to kind of figure out where to put this AC power line carrier. There's noise on certain lines, on certain circuit so you have to move it around from place to place in the house and plug it directly into an outlet with a good signal and that signal may change if, if the electrical things in the house change somebody plugs something else in or if the customer moves the gateway or often the customer says gee i already have two things plugged into this outlet i'm going to take out my my gateway i'm going to put in a power strip and i'm going to plug the gateway into the power strip and guess what boom that solar's not working anymore we get a phone call we can't win. Bottom line, it's not reliable enough. High percentage of monitoring systems failed in some way, even though the microinverters almost always worked perfectly. I mean, these, these things are working like super hard, super great. So here's the thing. Why don't we install the monitoring gateway outdoors? Well, that's what we did with Fat Spaniel back in 2001. There's three problems with putting the gateway outside, all of them which you can overcome. First is they always need AC power. That means the installer has to find an outlet next to where they're going to put the gateway that's GFI rated and run a a wire to that. It's tricky. So usually the, the installer has to run a new circuit with a GFI outlet. And the second thing is the gateway needs to be outdoor rated. So you just can't take one of these internal boxes. you got to have it in an enclosure. That enclosure is expensive. Ideally, you want to design the enclosure so it's all outdoor rated and you just have a cord connection to it. And then the third thing is you're going to be, if you're dependent on an Ethernet internet connection, you have to run an Ethernet cable from this outdoor gateway somewhere inside where your router is. So it's a little tricky to do. Now, another microinverter company, SolarBridge, they were kind of like the second biggest. They came up with a good solution. They developed a, a kind of a nice turnkey outdoor rated gateway with a built-in AC connection and an Ethernet port on it. Well designed, well thought out. Fatal problem? Here, here we go again. There's something else. It worked out pretty well to install. The software that was working on this thing wasn't really working well enough for contractors and homeowners, and it wasn't really working well enough for their OEM partners. So what ended up happening is the microinverters worked great, but the installers and the customers and the OEMs were frustrated that they couldn't communicate with their systems reliably. Uh, somebody over there told me that they had some kind of like off-the-shelf Linux communication box, and just getting everything to work properly was a challenge. And they never really got it working. SolarBridge, great hardware, bad software, and it just kind of you know, probably killed the company. Now, what about these new wireless communication protocols? There's Wi-Fi. We all know what that is. There's Zigbee. There's Bluetooth. Well, Zigbee's got kind of some good range, and Wi-Fi has some good range. So why not use Zigbee or Wi-Fi to communicate from things on the roof or things in the house to outside? Well, here's the thing. Communications will fail in a high percentage of com consumer homes. And this is we knew this from the get-go, from the first time we tried this back in like 2003. You have insulation in your attic or in your roof, foil insulation. The signal can't get through that foil insulation. Stucco houses have chicken wire behind the stucco. That's what's supporting the stucco. Signal sometimes can't get through that. Now, a solution is you can 
can put a booster antenna in on the roof. But that's a non-starter for most solar installers because you're kind of pricing the job, assuming everything's going to go smoothly. And you find out like after spending a day there or two days that, oh, the communications isn't good enough. You're always finding that in the evening. All right. Now what do you do? You have to go back. You have to charge the customer money. You got to put this antenna on the roof. You got to drill a hole through the roof into, you know, past the insulation or past the stucco, the wire behind the stucco. And sometimes you need power for that thing. It's a big hassle. Dead on arrival as far as a solution for most experienced solar contractors are going to say, hey, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. We're going to have to go a different way. But using that communication protocol is going to mean that 10, 20 percent of our jobs are going to be a hassle. I don't want a hassle on any of my jobs. OK, what about inverters with built in Wi-Fi? Great idea. The problem is that inverters are generally designed to be installed outside. They have a really solid case around them. It's, it's a metal case, ideally, and it, it creates a Faraday cage so that none of the signals inside the inverter get out and provide any radio interference. And heck, the first inverter that I installed it was a, a Xantrex SunTie. It was always uh, creating radio interference on the AM radio. Customers would get mad because they couldn't listen to the AM radio. Who listens to AM radio anymore? Not that many people, but it was a problem. So these inverter cases, to be durable, prevent noise getting out, they can't get the, the Wi-Fi signal out. So even though there's a built-in Wi-Fi connection, it doesn't have very long range. Oh, oh, what you can do is you can put it in an external antenna, and that's exactly what we do with one of the major string inverter companies. But then what we found is that even with this antenna, the software that re was required to set this thing up was really complicated. A very complicated set of procedures. I mean, translated from a foreign language. And the software connection between the inverter to an antenna outside the inverter to the home internet connection, you may have an in internet booster, you have a router to the central server that's being maintained by the internet company was dropping out often and doesn't automatically reset. We even saw that, you know, in some of the tech support documentation, it said, if there's too much internet traffic in your house, if there's too much Wi-Fi traffic, the monitoring is going to drop out and you need to manually reset the inverter. You know what? That's kind of a non-starter. So what's happening is if even though the hardware is good, if the software is not good, customers contractors are going to be reluctant to install these systems. After installing a bunch of them, a half a dozen or more, you find out that a high percentage of customers are mad at the contractor because they can't get the monitoring to work. And, you know, that affects their reputation. So we switch to different equipment. So what works best? Let's just you know, talk about something that's really, what should we do? Here's the end, bottom line. Cellular monitoring works best. Think about your personal internet communication networking experiences. How often does your home Wi-Fi become unreliable? Can't get a signal, can't open up a web page, whatever. Eh, eh. How many times a day? How often does your cellular signal become unreliable? Well, mine's pretty good. I mean, if it's working, it's just working. It almost never goes out. Yeah, sometimes there may be some weak areas, but it's reliable. So cellular is simply a better way to communicate with the internet than Wi-Fi. Now, looking forward, this communication is going to be even more important. Battery systems, they need even more communications because you have to communicate the home energy consumption and solar production. You need to send more data to the central server more regularly. And you're going to need to remotely update and diagnose the inverter and system issues. And this is, this is something that kind of fits into what a new requirement in California is called Rule 21. So the Rule 21 requirements are inverters have to provide some grid support services. Now, inverters were originally designed to shut down if there was the slightest variation in voltage or slightest frequency disturbance. But what was happening, and the inverters were shut down when there was only 10 inverters in a neighborhood, the utility didn't care. But when there's a lot of them, and there's just a little ripple in the electricity, a whole neighborhood or area's worth of inverters are going to shut down, and, and the utility is going to say, hey, what happened to all this power we were getting? It causes disruptions. So Rule 21, the first phase, requires what's called ride-through if there's a slightly high voltage on the grid or a low voltage on the grid, and a ride-through if this frequency isn't exactly 60 hertz. I don't know what the number is, but if it's 58, it has to keep working, whereas if it goes down to 55, it stops. And it also requires that inverters start up slowly. They softly restart, which most of them do. They also ramp up fairly slowly. And there's a couple of other things, fixed power factors and volt var management. And these are just different ways of, of maintaining the type of power that's on the lines. It's kind of a generally a good thing. And we're in the middle of phase one right now for Rule 21. Phase two of Rule 21 is a little bit more complicated. It requires communications for inverters, 
a low inverter companies, you got to figure this out. So then because the utilities and manufacturers may want to make adjustments to their inverters with software or firmware updates, and even on a residential basis, we're regularly getting requests to update the firmware on our inverter. That requires good communications over the internet. But guess what? In my experience, we haven't had determined how to do this. We're still putting in wired systems, and in our experience, cellular is really kind of the only thing that works well. This is the other issue. Competitive utilities are going to want to reach back into your inverter and reduce its power output. Well, the solar industry doesn't want this to happen, so we're, we're kind of being careful about that. Okay, what solutions are working well in the market right now for communications? Communications protocol, in my view, has to be cellular or it has to be hardwired with Ethernet into a reliable internet connection. You have to have a good hardware design. Put the gateway outside, make sure it's outdoor rated and make sure it's easy to install. And you have to have good software three types. You have to have good software so the customer can see an app. You need a good software so the contractor and the installer can get this thing installed quickly. And you have to have good administrative software. So, looking at companies, who has good solutions? Sunrun has a pretty good solution still. They've got this separate electric meter with a cellular communication. It works. Very reliable. Enphase has a good solution as long as you install their AC combiner box with the enclosure outside and put the gateway inside, and as long as you use their cellular modem. Um, and then it works just like kind of just like installing a regular inverter. But, you know, you got this big box outside, that's where you make the connections, and it works. You still, with Enphase, have power line carrier communications over the AC lines. That's sometimes flaky, but I like the fact that you can put this gateway in the outside combiner box. The best solution is really from SolarEdge right now. They have a cellular modem built into the inverter, the web server's built in, um, the gateway's built in, and you've got a SIM card. You just take, the inverter comes with a SIM card, plug that SIM card in, it's good for five years, five years later, get a new SIM card. So the gateway's the inverter, no separate box. There's an antenna on the outside. You can still connect with a hard wire with an Ether cable if you want, and you can still probably use Wi-Fi or, or Zigbee, I, I ignore that. And the power line carrier communications over DC lines is pretty good, and their software's really good. So, my recommendations to inverter companies, don't underestimate the difficulties of the software, the hardware, and the installation. Go cellular for communication protocol with an alternate for Ethernet. And if you're going to claim that Wi-Fi, Zigbee, or some kind of wireless is going to work, you're going to have to test it and make sure it works on 100 out of 100 customers. Finally, make sure you have an alternative to regular current transformers or CTs. We use something called Rogowski coils at Cinnamon Energy Systems because CTs often don't fit over the power lines. And my recommendation for homeowners and businesses, go with a system that has cellular monitoring if you want monitoring, or pay a little extra, get a hard wire Ethernet connection in. The monitoring has to be designed into your system. Adding it on later is really, really a challenge. Okay, that's all the time we have on this week's Energy Show. Thanks to all of our listeners for tuning in. And if you missed any of today's show, you can always go to our website at cinnamon.energy and listen to the podcasts. So, you want to save the world with clean energy? Make money doing it? Confused about the economic and technical realities of residential and commercial solar, batteries, heat pumps, EVs? Want the real-world scoop on new energy technologies, not manufacture hype? Then tune in to the Weekly Energy Show, hosted by Barry Cinnamon. Insights from Barry's 40-plus years in the solar and energy industry will help you understand the future ways we'll generate and consume energy. And now, here's Barry. Barry.